Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of ATG After Dark Syndicate, the syndicate version. I am host Jeff Black. I'm joined today by my good bro, Jason Theobald, a.k.a. Scooby. We are minus Jason Roberson. He is currently in Beijing. We hope he is okay, but he is negotiating a business deal in Mandarin Chinese. Huge, huge As deal. we speak, huge, big deal. He's got a minor in Mandarin Chinese negotiating power deal. But we are without him. But today we are joined by the awesome Taylor DeHayes. She is joining us all the way from Dallas. Not Bookshare at that time. Ha ha! Hooked on phonics worked for me. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to talk about like that mid-level. So in the last episode we did, that'd be more like a beginner episode if you're listening to how a to beginner your crash five, course. Clients. We yeah, talk about, talk like about that. like how to start mm -hmm. kind of getting the the wheels, the grease going. Mm -hmm. um, because once you kind of get it going, if it's going to go, it goes. So where we thought we'd go with this episode was assuming that you're making six figures a year. So we'll say 100K. How do you get to that 7K? What is the seven sales? Eight. Seven figures, sorry. Seven K. Yeah. How do you recede? How do you take your business down? I, how do you go backwards? <laughs> but we thought I don't think today enough weed before we start. Uh, I probably need more. Yeah. We we want to talk about the sales <laughs> and how that relates to scales. <laughs> because ultimately everyone's trying to scale their business for the most part. At least in some fashion, some way. But we might get to the point of people aren't wanting to scale anymore. Yeah. And what does that even mean? Me, right? Exactly. Like what does scaling mean? Yeah. I think oh, defining what, is, that. what does it even mean? Because yeah. actually I don't even know. If I ever like scaled, scaled ever as a business, like I've grown as my business has grown, but I don't know if I've ever set forth a plan what is a to scale? actually scale. So, I mean, this yes, is where this conversation by goes. going from 200 yeah. members to a thousand. And now you're going to scale, in my opinion, by knocking out that wall and going to 3,500. Well, yeah, and then you would, I, and then a scale would be adding another gym. Right. And it just goes, yeah, and goes. I see it like not, that. Is, that, is that not how you do it? No, I guess when I'm thinking of scales. And this is where I'm at. Like when I got to six figures, it was kind of like, well, where do I go next? I didn't know where to always go. I just kind of went where I thought the business needed to go. There was no the form. Led your yeah, the business yeah. led can my we, scale. Can we say that scaling is bringing in um, new technologies, new uh, things that help? Because you got to bring in the things that help you take on the more clients, right? So that seems scaling to me. You got to put more systems in place to help you be able to support your new direction, right? I mean, is that. I, so I, I categorize business in three categories. Like there's okay. three different categories as you grow your business and they're cyclical. So there's the build, grow, scale. Build is just like the foundations, right? Mm -hmm. So monetary value, it's probably like filling your roster, whatever that means to you. Okay. okay? Building is adding on top or sorry, growing is adding on top of that. So you're adding utility and then scale is volume. So that's when you're like rapidly hitting a seven figure mark. Now it may not be, you know, 10 K to 30 K to hundred K. It may, you may have seasons in a year where there's that's, that's the cycle. But ultimately what my point is, is every time you master something, whatever level of scale that is, you've got to learn a new skill again right, to, to get to the, the next level. Mm -hmm. So I think whatever scale is to you, it just has to match an idea and vision you have. And that vision could be a six month vision, but that's my definition of scale is just, you're growing to reach a new level, Correct. but what that level is, I think is going to change because never once, and I'm sure you guys probably said the same thing, but I never once said I want to have a seven figure business. I, I agree. I don't think that was ever the goal. Jason's like, I did. <laughs> Uh, I didn't think about it. I thought okay. it was impact. When I first started, no. It That's was going to I mean. be vacation money. Correct. And then once it hit and it started rolling, after about two years, yeah, I, I wanted but to seven-figure business. But it probably seemed feasible then. Correct. Right. So, like, if you're starting out and you're like, I need to get my first 30 going. clients, mm -hmm. if you just want to make a million dollars, you're in the – get out. Yeah. You're not going to – you're yeah. not going to make it. I totally agree. <clears throat> yep. What is scale to you? Or I guess let's uh, use your experience. Yeah. You just brought up your experience. What has the scale been like to you? Because you were a lawyer yeah. and you were business, you know, and then you got that. I was about to say business coach, mm -hmm. nutrition, health professional. Like Jay, Jay Jason's would, business coaching now, guys. <laughs> yeah. He's like, Jay, don't Jason's, put that out there. Jason's no. going to offer $9,999 no. per, month. For, I, per I, month. I know where my lanes are, you know? <laughs> like at 46, I know what I'm good at and I'm not. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to leave Taylor to the business coaching. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because she's the things she comes up with are very intelligent, and I probably would not have came up with them. Okay. So, but, how did um, they like but scaling to me, <clears throat> I think it's a process of improving your efficiencies. Like, think about it. Like, 
it, I couldn't have scaled to the amount of clients I had if I didn't have fee for function. So that had to be built and put in place, right? So as yeah, I got to these- you were on an annoying ass Excel sheet when I first got with you. Yeah. Because right. I remember I made you so mad. Right. When, I, when he first hired me, I heard, first hired him, he gave me macros. I was like, what the fuck is this? Because I was used to a set meal plan. Like on and a then, Google sheet or what? No, he just gave me numbers and email. And he gave this a Google sheet. And it was just numbers here. And it had column and he had weight. And you just track. And it like, had your macros yeah, up on the Yeah, yeah. And you Excel pretty much, too. pretty much were just and like. And would track his That's how I notes. was though. Okay, okay. But, but this was funny. I hadn't seen that before. Okay. And he was so frustrated. <laughs> what year was this? <laughs> this is 2013. 13. That makes so much sense yeah, though. Yeah, because it was so funny because I know what he means because like when he first gave it to me, I couldn't visualize it. And you know, this is back in the emails when you're getting Jason, lawyer Jason. So you're getting like one sentence, bro, read and Google what macros are. Oh, that's <laughs> definitely, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Jason still so kind of, what I mean by hey, that, hey, what I, mean I came by that is, a long way. No, but what I mean by that is that's what we, that's what I mean. Like, did he, so I never seen something like that. So I was like, oh, this is like what a check-in chart's like. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I you what a check You know, it's like very, it was very rudimentary check -in. Yeah, it's very totally. rudimentary. And so as I grew yeah. and I got to a certain number of clients, that didn't work. It didn't work anymore. And yeah. so I had to go all in and invest in the fee for function app. Totally. And now I've got pictures everywhere I need and I can boom, 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 win quick and I'm, and I'm, I'm organized and I can, I can give you a 10 minute loom video and I'm covering everything that might take a coach 40 minutes to look at all their different places. Mm -hmm. So that is part of scaling. You've got to have efficiencies in place that allow you to do it. That's what I feel like a scaling is volume. And then you got to have the efficiency. That's my, if your that's business my were to, this is just a hypothetical for anyone listening. But if your business were to triple overnight, what would break first? Yep. And if the answer you is go. you, we have a problem, yeah. right? That's how I like to test my systems because once you hit the six figure mark, every time your business grows 20%, one of your systems breaks. It's just inevitable. You're constantly fixing and, and things should be breaking if you're scaling fast enough. Mm -hmm. If things are not breaking, you're not growing fast enough. I and by know. breaking, you just mean there's less of an efficiency in that Correct. Process, or, or the automation SOP. is not sufficient or sophisticated enough, mm -hmm. right? right? Whatever that happens to be. Correct. It can't mm -hmm. support yeah. what you need. The there might not say it can't support the growth. Break. It's just, it's, yes, it's, it's not as efficient. Or break isn't, it's, it's not working anymore though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times it, it ends up being you first. So, oh my God, my check-in days are four days a week now. I literally only have one day a week to work on other things. Okay. Well, that's a flawed system, mm -hmm. right? Or mm -hmm. whatever it is. Yeah. I'm just over here where he was like, you were talking about all this stuff and then my mind immediately pops to how Jason advanced. And I got you, we got to have a funny Jason story moment. So in 2017, I'm six weeks out from a show. I okay. send him my check-in and I swear to God, Taylor, I updated this and Jason sends it back. And it's like, I don't see nothing. I was, so I like replied something snippy and he goes, and I replied with the pictures. He replies back. I know you're six weeks out but I'm not going to have you talk to me like that. <laughs> and this is how this is going to go. And by the way, your food is being cut. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, how the hell so and then when he then we went to like lube now i have like a lube video when he does it for me i'm like oh i can see jason's face yeah. and the scale and so forth now i want to actually i want to take the conversation <laughs> into the spot where we've talked about the evolution talked about systems when we're we have customer service or what are they called crms Mm -hmm. Is that what they are? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm trying to, I was just blanking. Yeah, no. I know because I have kahunas for my clients. I have mm -hmm. mind body. Is there certain things when a certain level, when a person is getting to, like, is that the, good question. where they get, they want to put a CRM? Is there like I a mean, number where you say, Hey, at this point, you, you stop fucking cool. around. Yeah. Honestly, I'm, we're promoting that very early on now. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't have probably even a year ago. And here's the only reason. So my first priority when I work with any client though, and again, I'm talking about in my beginner program is just like getting them acclimated. Now, if you come to me and you're running a six figure business and there's like no automations, which is really common, right? Yeah, you're like, I, cause I'm not a tech person. Okay. So I've always mm -hmm. outsourced that yeah, stuff. Like I, I got a there. VA yeah. very early on because I was like, I don't know this and I, it's going to take me longer to learn it. But if once you're realizing, okay, you're paying for an email service and a website and your cart yeah. here and your client app here, once you've got 
that going on, or if you know that you want to build a course in the future, I would recommend going to a more robust CRM where everything is in one. Absolutely. And then once you're getting close, once you start building out a sales team, right. And you want to start auditing their performance and their data and have, you know, a high level overview of your metrics. To me, that's a half million dollar business. And I wish I would have done that sooner, but migrating to something like yeah. go high level is a really popular one. What is um, it like, what does that do? Can you give me like a couple of key examples sure, of what go sure. high level would, would offer me as a business owner? So you're going to have Stripe can integrate through it, but it could be okay. your cart. So you could check it out. You could check out through there. Your, um, if a payment fails, you can automate collection email sequences. Your emails go out through there. Your team communication is through there. You create a sales pipeline so I can see all of my new leads from ads and basically I can move them through a pipeline so I can see, oh, Jessica is new. My team has dialed her twice. Now she booked a call. Oh, we closed her. I made this much money, right? So like you can track that. You can track data per setter, per closer. So it just gives you a higher level view of all of that as with whatever you're doing in there, right? Um, that one doesn't have a client app though, whereas something like Caboodle has the app attached to it. But again, I don't think everyone needs that necessarily. Um, we have go high level for our sales team primarily and our data and whatnot. But then in terms of my course, that's on something called Kajabi, where I knew I wanted that system because we wanted to be accredited by AFA, um, NASA and things like that. And there are only certain CRMs they approve, mm. right? Why is that the case? <clears throat> because in Kajabi, for example, I can literally see the second somebody stopped watching a module. Whereas like in a Kartra, which we were using before, if I start a video and stop it, it'll say completed. So mm. it's just, you can check. And we also have a guarantee. So if I'm going to guarantee free coaching, if you don't succeed, I've got to see the second and the date and all of that. So it helps us also track client success, yeah. Yeah. right? What module is least completed, which module is stalling clients the most. So again, having systems like, and that's where, you know, this is shit I didn't think of day one, right? I'm like, let me put this course out there and get some results. Yeah. It's three years later. I'm like, yeah. let me dial in and get results faster based on what we've used and what we've collected. So that's where I think like the systems are important, but you could start early. Sure. Whatever. But at the end of the day, I would say once you reach that half million dollar business level, I would, I would want a dialed in CRM. And, and this is also to manage how many contact points you're having with a client. Yeah. From yeah. Your business. Like a nurture them, right? right. So how, okay. So something I think we should talk about because I, it, it blew, blows my mind every time I hear how many, much contact you should have with a client, how much you're talking about a lead or a client lead, leads. Okay. Leads, okay. Leads. How much contact do you recommend businesses have with the lead that they're working with? Like once they get this integrated and they're sure. letting it go to automations, because sure. that would be a new thing they'd be doing. Yeah. So I might have a different take than some of the sales gurus. So I'll kind of just tell you what, what we do. So go high level is tracking our inbound. So again, anyone coming in from ads outbound is not auto populating unless they literally opt in to something from an ad, right? Cause we run ads to lead magnet. So if my team is like reaching out, Hey Jeff, da da da, starting conversations, you know, I mean a cold to close average in the industry is about eight weeks. Mm. Okay. So that's again, a cold lead. They're not coming in from an ad. Now, if we get an ad coming in or somebody coming in from an ad, we're looking at maybe a three week two week, three week turnaround, four on the, on the high side of getting them to book a call with us. So anything less though than about three weeks. And we start to see buyer's remorse happening. So I think it's important to understand, like people are not going to go from, I'm also selling multi four figure packages, right? So it's like, I don't want to sell somebody that high of a package and then regret it and bail on a contract. Right. So mm -hmm. it's like, we're, we're also being mindful there and pre-qualifying them take some time. Um, but Touch points for somebody from an ad, I would say we reach out at least 10 times until we disqualify them. That could be via SMS, that could be via DM, email, whatever. But until they just have ignored us for 10 times, we, we stop. Wow. Now for cold tra or for, sorry, well for cold traffic that's coming in from organic, five touch points until we give up on okay. the lead. Yeah. What makes those numbers about, is that just what you've seen over time when you start stepping back about five, 10 touch points and then kind of like, ah, yeah, that's kind of like the breaking point. If we see that somebody isn't responding, but they're watching my stories and opting into my stuff, it's clear that they are lurking. 
So I won't totally disqualify them. We've had people never respond and come back six months later saying, hey, I'm ready to pay you. Right? They're just kind of like watching. I've seen that before. I've had people be like, I've followed you for like two years. Right, right. So I'm like, right. oh, okay, yeah. that's cool. But when you opt in from an ad, you have shown clear interest and intent with me. So that's why I reach out more faster because if I'm reaching out to you, you don't know who the hell I am. So I'll give you five, I'll, I'll try five times and five times in the span of like three weeks. Okay. So I'll send a message on Monday. If they've opened it and they didn't respond, I will send another message 24 hours later saying bumping this up just to see. Mm -hmm. And then maybe three days later and then a week later. Right. So mm -hmm. I just kind of keep an eye on them and you'll lose some of them. Like we're not, we're not perfect. If we find 50 leads a day, I'm not catching mm -hmm. up with all of them every day, sure. but that's what we try to do. So we don't lose anybody. But for the ads, it's like you clearly downloaded my lead magnet on sales strategies. So like, I know, you know who I am and you have a problem and I can mm -hmm. solve it. Right. So that's why I stay on them Got it. more. Speaking of ads, what are your thoughts on them? <clears throat> is this <clears throat> six figure is kind of where we start talking about ads. I know from running a gym and I know from talking to my friends who are in a small business, the ad budgets are some of the most insane numbers I've ever heard. <clears throat> Example guy I know who owns a chimney company, $18,000 a month. Like, you know what I mean? And, and I've heard as low as, I micro boast a post at a dollar a day. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain point that a person needs to be looking at ads and how do you start advising people to wiggle through that and where to make their best investments first, I guess. So there's a lot of variables, but very, very beginning. If you suck at marketing taglines, email funnels, don't run ads because You've got to be really dialed in and ready to make changes. I mean, we are constantly refilming, doing new hooks, updating email sequences, changing landing pages because it's based on the market. I could put out something that I think is great and the market may be like, I hate this, right? And then if we get it dialed in, we'll just keep it. But ultimately, I'm constantly changing different pieces of that. Now, I ran ads very late in the game. So I had already hit a full seven figure year before I ever ran ads which I think is rare and Facebook I don't book ads and none, the, none. What yeah. are you, what are you running now? I'm doing Facebook ads, Facebook and Instagram. Prior, you were not correct. Mm -hmm. No, no. Seven figures was organic for me. And then for me to go from, you know, one to three mil, we were like, okay, let's really ramp this up. Right. Um, content was dialed in delivery was dialed in. I think a lot of, and my sales funnel is dialed in. So here's the thing. If, if you run ads too early, you're like, well, okay, I just want to get more leads in the door. Cool. You can get more leads in the door, but if you still can't convert them to book a call with you, it doesn't matter. Right. Like I think that's what people don't understand. I personally don't think that you should run ads until you have at least 2k a month to throw at it. Mm -hmm. So you can just test a lot of stuff, right? Because we're getting to the point where we're realistically spending the equivalent of a new car every month to really get things dialed in. Now that's not where we're at now, but that's where we're growing to this year. And so part of our strategy this year was to really maximize and become an expert in paid advertising. And we've seen that, but that also meant my sales team had to grow. So again, it's like, if you're ready to run ads, I know people will tell you boost a post, try the ads, this and that every coach I've ever seen, test an ad too early, they waste money, they fail, they get mad at the process, they think nothing's working. And really they never knew how to sell their, their offer without an ad anyway. So that's my take on it. I think that people do it way too early. Um, I think that you should have an ads manager teach you that. I don't think you should try it on your own. I think that's one of those really dialed in skills because that way an ads manager can say like, Hey, this marketing isn't up to par. Like you're not ready. Go back, try again later. Um, and I also think too, it depends on your business model. If you're a solopreneur and you don't want a team of assistant coaches, you don't need ads. You can mm -hmm. only have so many private clients. Mm -hmm. I think ads work really well when you're running them to a lead magnet that filters into an offer, right? So we're, we're only running like one or two ads directly to fitness coach Academy, but everything else is coming in at a lead magnet to get them in there. So if you don't even have quality lead magnets, it's another problem too. I want to break that out a little bit. What is a quality lead magnet? The you know, from a, a, like you know that a, a some like something that's free, that's either a yeah. downloadable, a resource, a workshop. You know that you're producing something that people are literally purchasing after watching that. And it may not be directly, like it may not be, oh, I downloaded, click, I bought. But damn, I watched your workshop, and this made me realize X, Y, Z, and that ends up kind of leading to a sale. So okay, 
let's go with this real quick. Are you taking them? Where does the ad go? Is that going to like a landing page? Yes. Okay. Yep. Let's talk about that then, the importance of a website. So by now you're at the six-figure time. You want to do ads. You obviously have to have a website. Um, with a landing page, are you A-B testing these ads with, say, let's use the hypothetical $2,000 a month mm -hmm. and you're setting this up. Mm -hmm. Would you A, 1000 B, 1000 and then run the two ads and start seeing what happens? How would you kind of like advise people to do that? Do you believe more ads is better? Because there's a lot of different advice out there. I mean, at the end of the day, it depends on what space you're in. So we're at the level where for me to make a dent, I have to outspend my competitors, which is why we've had really high profit margins to save up for this year. Like I knew it was coming, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if somebody is just trying to get um, exposure, I would recommend doing some playthrough ads, which are basically, we all know what those talking head reels look like, right? With the closed captioning. Um, it's not, not the trending reel sounds, but just like the Hermosi style reels, mm -hmm. like take some of your best performing and run those as ads. And just that way it looks like it's an organic post in someone's feed. So more of like awareness campaigns are really helpful. Um, but I don't think A and B is, is bad. I think an A-B test is totally fine, but I would probably do an A-B test with one lead magnet and two different landing pages or two different um, taglines just to see what your audience is responding to best. I think what's so fascinating here is as my mind starts working because that's how like, well, I get in these podcasts. I'm like, okay, so as a business owner I'm now thinking I have to have someone to manage my website, manage my social media, this, this ads manager, you start thinking about like bolting on pieces to your operation. How is there certain budget things you recommend for a coach? Like meaning if they're making say 250 K a year, how much of their budget should they start moving and maneuvering towards marketing yeah. paid ads, mm -hmm. having people who are doing stuff like, what are your recommendations? Are you like Dave Ramsey? Like, Hey, live on like $40,000 a year and no. put like everything else into it and like explode the shit out of it. Or how I do you kind of recommend that? I think your profit margins are going to be shitty around quarter million because that's really when you start to hire the two most important people in your business, which are going to be a setter and some kind of a business manager or like an advanced virtual assistant. So somebody to really manage your support email, um, automate everything, make sure KPIs are tracked, project management, right? Like that's your first expensive hire and then a setter. And I know my profit margin when I was making 30 K months, I was paying between paying a mentor, an assistant and a setter. I, I was spending 15 K a month on all of that stuff. Maybe a little bit more. My mentor is also $12,500 a month. So it was not yeah. a good experience, but I did anyway. Can you tell you what a setter is? An appointment setter, a DM person. Oh, setter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So those two, like you don't need, that's, that's where I think people, they get this shiny object syndrome because again, they've hit a quarter million. Now they're like, I need to do all these things. No, you don't just do them better. You don't need an ads manager that early on. I mean, and an ads manager, again, TBD on what they cost. Cause they're, it's a wild, wild west out there, but probably 1200 bucks a month realistically to like run your ads and stuff, which to me makes sense if they're doing the copy for you and the, and the design, the graphics. Cause I had an ad manager very briefly, great experience. My business just wasn't at the place to really scale that yet. And I mean, they were doing all of the copy, all of the graphics, everything. So that was like a really nice all inclusive service. And they were dialing in the audience so as well. $1,200 a month fee plus advertising. Plus what I wanted to spend on ads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was probably spending about total 2,500 a month. Gotcha. We weren't, we weren't spending a ton and we did that maybe three months to test it out. And then we, we pulled back because again, I wasn't at the, at the place in my business where I could spend a ton of extra time creating new copy all the time. Um, and it really wasn't sounding like my voice and I didn't like that. Mm. So I pulled back and we stopped, but I think, you know, people get so hung up and caught up with this stuff. Like, well, I don't want to edit. Let me hire a videographer. Suck it up, buttercup. Also, you don't need fancy videos. Like you don't need them. I love editing video. I edit my little 90 <clears throat> second reels. I don't mind them. It's easy to do. You get in shot. It's dirt cheap. I think that people reach a level and they think I'm too good to do this anymore. And they reach it too early. There's a sense of entitlement with entrepreneurs that they reach. And I'm like, you haven't done shit. I mean, that sounds so bad, no, but like I you agree. haven't done shit yet. Your business has no proof yet. Sure. You've maybe hit a quarter million. That's awesome. And I want to applaud you for that. But I guarantee you on the back end, you have no utility. You don't know how you actually make sales. You probably are not paying your ACs appropriately. 
you don't even know what an OBM stands for. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're not a business owner yet. Mm -hmm. And so I think that quarter million to 500 K is where you have to really put your business owner hat on and think, how do I become a CEO? How do I really step up? Because that's going to require you to make, you know, instead of a thousand dollar decisions, they're like $10,000 decisions and risks it a little bit bigger. Right. And I think that people hire their best friend cause they do editing. And it's like, if you hire cheap, you're going to pay for it later. And so I think spending the time to really dial in who you need, but keep a lean team as long as you can. The more people you have, the more problems you're going to have in your business. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, what I hear is <clears throat> I'm sitting back and I'm like, all right, I think at this point, cause I'm asking myself where am I at as a person? I think you and I both could agree like, oh, the DM setter, that's a great position for probably both well, you I and I. I don't know how it exactly worked for me because people are asking me lab questions and you yeah, know, how would of, that work in that case? Because mine's not like his because like all my interaction is usually based upon like the podcast, like people want to know more about like this, that and the other thing. Mine are easier applies. How would he, how would a setter work in the scenarios? I would like say that? they're toggling because you're getting a lot of inbound, right? Yeah. It's so all I man. think it would be more of like warming them up and you would work with your setter to determine a series of just a few questions to throw out. And then you would have to have certain, certain intake forms ready to go. So maybe it's not an application, but like if they're struggling with adrenal, this, this and that, whatever. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Before we move forward, can you fill out this five question questionnaire and you kind of pre-qualify and if they check yes, or if they meet the qualifications, you send them to your team. So I think they're just buffering and really handling the, the volume for you. Yeah. Like gig here. Yeah. See, I hear that. And I'm like, that's something I would immediately put into my business at this point. The other one that you recommend, that's like the business manager. Yep. Project manager, whatever. What would that person offer in around that half million point that, as you say, putting on the CEO hat that you <clears> say, <throat> look, you really want to have this piece. Yeah. I know about it in the gym side. I have my integrator in Thera, mm -hmm. but in the online space, I have no one. It's just me. What, what, yeah. would I, what would that look like? They're doing everything from course build out to managing our CRM. Like building a course. Define what that looks like. So if I'm building out the curriculum in terms of like I'm creating the actual education, they're making it come to life. They're putting it in the system. They're the Kajabi, making the presentations. Uses, right? They're auditing. Yeah, they're auditing the metrics and all of that. But I'm staying like all that you need to be doing in your business are of course the like delivery and fulfillment, but sales and marketing, like sales and marketing is where you need to really focus your attention. Everything else can be outsourced at the half million dollar mark, right? Like you need to make sure that your time is not spent doing admin stuff anymore. So they're handling payroll, they're handling failed payments, they're handling contracts, onboarding, offboarding, testimonial collection, managing your team. They're putting out job postings and managing, uh, hiring, firing, all of that kind of stuff. Is here brittle to unbreakable my life story an autobiography that can't resist being a self-help book brittle to unbreakable.com in it you're going to find probably the most raw journaling th session as my good friend jason theobald says about the book i chronicalized my life with a brittle bone disease known as osteogenesis perfecta and culminated how i got into bodybuilding through being bullied and later on steroid use and ultimately modern medicine not one to wipe away the stain of suicide i had on my soul and it led me to find psychedelics to find ultimate relief. I have an honest conversation here, brittle to unbreakable.com. And if you'd like some health and fitness coaching, I kind of do that too. I'm Taylor DeHaze and I am here helping you scale your business all the way from getting your first 10 clients to getting off the gym floor all the way to your first seven figures. If you have any questions about that or want to learn more about me, you can find me on Instagram at Taylor Fit. That's T-A-E-L-E-R-F-I-T. Hey, I'm Jason Theobald, functional health coach. I own scoobyhealth.com. We have a group of about 13 very educated coaches that can help you out with your functional health journey. I also own Advanced Vitality HRT. Com. And this is a clinic with full service for all your HRT and anti-aging needs. Also, check us out at newethics.com. I'm a co-founder of that supplement company.
Thank you. Okay, so as we're on the topic of ads, where should someone start spending about money, budget? It's very subjective, but where do you start telling people to lean in when they're around this phase? Like the dollar amounts are just set on fire and not worry about it burning. <laughs> I think when you have a really dialed in result and you have dialed in organic leads coming in. Okay, elaborate dialed in. Okay. That's where immediately I'm like, all right, what do you mean? Because how do you know, how do you know you're even dialed in? And again, everyone's gonna have a different perspective on this. I'm sure another business coach may say something different, but <laughs> if you know that you are getting epic results with your offer, you've got great retention, all of that feels good. And you're like, man, okay, I've also got leads coming in. I know that if I don't run ads, I'm still making money. Like I'm still making sales without them. So you're mm. organic is almost at its capacity, right? Like you, you've reached your potential. I would encourage you to have a setter as well when you're running ads because you're about to get a ton of influx, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you have to be ready to like nurture those people. I think when people just run ads and they're never in their DMs and then they get an influx of people, they don't know what to do. So they've got leads, but they can't nurture them. That's a problem. So I would say when organic feels very stable and dialed in, number one, you know how to market your offer because you need to have quality marketing materials and assets. Um, and also like you probably should be pretty good on camera. That sounds silly, but like your video ads should no, be compelling. I agree. I agree. Like if don't run ads to, I, I see this. Oh my God. I've seen people run ads to like generic stuff. Like someone was running an ad to some kind of a workshop and the ad wasn't even this person's face. It was like a generic bowl of fruit. I'm like, who's going to go to that? Mm -hmm. Who's going to go to this workshop? Right? So I don't know. It's, I think that that That's would be my suggestion. So yeah. Like that would be my suggestion. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So we have a little bit of it established. What are your thoughts on, um, the preference of Facebook and Instagram? Do you, do you tell people, is it one in the same when you're talking about splitting out dollars or do you say, Hey, lean more into this, lean more in that. What are your thoughts on TikTok even? I'm going to be honest with you. I am not the TikTok person at all. I don't even have TikTok. Like I literally don't have one. Um, which again, I'm sure is probably where I'm missing out maybe, but I, I get broke leads. Like my clients that use TikTok. I have two of them that really love it. And the other, all of them are, are just like, we get broke leads from TikTok. Like it's not really where we're seeing again. I'm not, I could see where that would be the case because yeah. the algorithm is so open. They yeah, say it's, that yeah. just anyone seeing it. But I think when you go, when you freaking go and you're running ads through Meta, like definitely do Facebook and Instagram. Like I would do both. Absolutely. Okay. Um, next question. What about your thoughts on Google ads and having like a Google business profile? And do you recommend any of these things? Because some business coaches out there say yes. Create a spot where if you were to Google Jason Theobald, it brings up his beautiful, smiling, sexy face and his reviews of cl glamour and love and all the stuff. And they can at least get an idea about him. But then I've heard other people say that shit don't matter. I don't see why that would hurt, but I would make sure that, you know, a lot of business managers have skills skill set when it comes to like SEO and whatnot and setting those things up. So I think if you know, that's where you want to go, I would make sure that whoever is working with you and your team can guide you. Like I would not trust myself to set that up. Like, you know what I mean? I would outsource that, but is that something that I'm focusing on right now? Not necessarily. So I don't know if I'm the expert with that. Yeah. I recently kind of got into like some SEO stuff because with like iron house, yep. my personal brand for the book, for sure. I had to like, so what I had to start doing was, I, I bought a few books on it, read it, and then I started like having conversations with my website guy who then referred me to people who have other conversations with who I can say this much. When you talk about an ads manager for Facebook and Instagram, you really have to have one for like Google ads. Like that's like a whole nother animal, a whole nother entity. Okay, so I'll speak to it not from the coaching side because I think that this is where if I can give some – Interesting thought at this point of business, what I've seen. People use Google like this. They'll see Jason or me on, or even you. And then they go to Google and they want to know more. And then they'll see what's up. And then they go back. Find a lot for me. And then they'll go back to Instagram. And then that's where I think that then they kind of make your decisions. Because what we see is we'll see them go from like Iron House on the Instagram to like Google Iron House and then go back over. And that's how like the lead forms, like we're able to kind of like see that. And I think people, when it comes to like my, the gym business, we make more money 
off of our Google ads, they go way further than our Facebook ads do. And we had years of data to track that, to be able to eventually say, okay, for example, I put $4,000 a month to Google ads, but I returned $16,000. Wow. So I'm four to one on the ratio. Doesn't that just mean that people are not using Instagram to find their gym? They're still using, they want like reviews, right? Because on Google, you can get reviews. Bingo. But what people figure out what the place that, feels like. That's where like. it goes to kind of like when you're, when you're talking about scaling your business. At the, at, when you're starting to get to this like half a million dollar, million dollar mark, you start niching down <laughs> and you can like go down the Google path. Because what I'm getting at is when you start putting into like a YouTube channel, and you start doing mm -hmm. SEO, search engine optimization, mm -hmm. your search engine optimization could go, has to go into your YouTube. It has to go into your website. And there's like all this front coding and back coding and then article coding. So when I got into it, we started seeing that people like Google key hit phrases. And then that was what we were buying up the keywords on. And then you get into a competition bid. And then like gym near me is like $100 versus like Planet Fitness near me, which is like 65 or something like that. And then you start bidding on the, on, the phrase, on the phrases and things like that. But the one thing I learned that I did not know <clears throat> was a lot of it was the SEO in relation to the articles. And this is something like I wish I had done and I'd never understood why people heavily built a home base website with. When you have those articles, you're typing in the SEO, you can link in all your Instagram. You can link in all the stuff. So what it'll do is when people Google, you will keep pulling up your stuff. And so it's like, it'll keep, you can keep refreshing and getting like the fastest stuff. So you're phrasing it and you're picking titles like people would put into Google, like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease cures. So there's this program called Simrush that I got and I'll like put in like key phrases and words and it'll tell me like how many people click it. And it'll give me all the dollar rates and everything like that. And I'm able to like see how to phrase all my articles. But, but I say it. You don't use that for your coaching though. No. So that's something that I found to be very interesting when I started digging through these. Something I learned that I think you guys might like. There's actually coaches who are here locally who've been doing it for the in-person and no one really does it for the online. And that was something I really like caught on to. Because you, you, I think you're going online and most people are thinking the online world of this. But a lot of people use Google to find their answers for things like they do with YouTube for a second. Oh, I get that. Engines, but right? why is it not working for coaching? Oh, I don't think it doesn't. I'll be honest, man. Like I have a lot of like articles and links and stuff like that that I wrote. And what it is, it's a lot of like, I'll notice shares off of it. So people are sharing it okay. where? So it's well, more Well, it must awareness. not be working for coaching if us coaches aren't doing it. Do you have anyone do it? No, I'm just talking about like where you could go as like the like a half a million dollar like weeds, man. Like I, I'm just saying that I feel like people aren't really talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's what I'm trying to say. Like this is something like, like a gym I recently, technique that could be transferable to online. Bingo. Yeah. It's it. something that I've kind of like was like, okay, because people's habits are they use Google for a lot Actually, of shit. I take that back. I do have coaches specifically in California, in person trainers that are moving online and they've done really well with their SEO as a personal trainer because it's pretty saturated and it's high ticket out there. Saying, yeah. And they're they're trying to kind of monetize that for online. But again, everyone I know that's doing that, they have somebody in their back pocket that is like an SEO expert or something like Let that. Let me just humor this real quick. Let me walk this out. What's stopping you from SEOing down Cincinnati, Ohio as an online coach and just niching the fuck down there because no one else is doing it? So someone types in personal trainer near me, boop, Jason Pops. Yeah. I'm not a personal trainer. To, to Listen, dude. I'm telling you, if you went out in public, most 8 out of 10 people in Nashville, Tennessee are going to be like, Jason Theobald's personal trainer is how they're going to relate. I'm going to call you that from now so, on. They're, they're, <laughs> but you, just because remember what you think of yourself doesn't mean most people don't identify as. I'm just saying they're going to want someone to walk them I mean, through workouts and I don't I do am. that. People yeah, don't know what the fuck I what? do. Yeah. But guess what? She's saying at the half million dollar point. Like we're, we're going in this, say, say you don't have a team and say we're saying at the half million dollar. She's saying you could build a whole course. We well, can build a whole course where you take people through chest workouts and all the exercises, totally. put it up there and then back and put it up there. And then you have a library built out yeah. like on Caboodle where you're just dropping and dragging and you're putting all that, but that would help you grow, get leads for your online coaches, like a funnel, you know, funnel then, yeah. because you're doing it all niche down in the Cincinnati, Ohio area. I got you. And that was kind of made me start thinking, I've seen it here and that's cool that you yeah. said you see it in California because the in-person trainers do it. And I'm like, well, fuck, man. Like, there are people, like, 
100 and plus some odd reviews who have like, when you go on their website, you can see where it's like heavily coded with SEO, like phrases, people would search and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's something that I've learned at this level of business that as I go further down the road, you have to pick this person up. So it's almost like in business at this point, you have to be willing to spend money to make money. Well, sure. That's really, that's that's the big thing. And that's the hang up. I mean, seriously, that is such a big hang up because a lot of people at this level typically have a mentor. I rarely see coaches that are, that are running multi six figure businesses without mentors. Um, because it's, it's either a hot mess or something. Right. And so by the time you pay your mentor, a lot of, a lot of people are spending quite a bit of money there. Um, but they're so afraid to make that ne- next investment. Like something that I've always done for whatever reason, I find it so easy to spend business money and so hard to spend personal money. That's just how I am. Um, I live well below my means and my friends and family make fun of me all the time for it. But when it comes to scaling your business, I always spend for where I want to go. I don't spend for where I am now. So like, sure, right now, this investment feels really challenging, but there's never been a single investment, even the bad ones where I didn't make more money from it. Right? Like, everything has taught me something. Everything has gotten me further. And I've literally been uncomfortable since day one. And I think too many people get comfortable in their level of income and they don't want to like rock the boat, but then they want to scale. And there's this tug of war going on mentally between do I want it? Do I not? Can I do it? Or am I sure? And I think that really holds people back is they're just not moving. Yeah. I could definitely see that being a thing. Do you have anything you want to chime in on that? Well, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, I was, I was somewhat in that position, at least on the coaching side, I think for a while, um, I was to the point where I was willing to spend what I was willing to spend and I, and I didn't want to invest anymore. And I had a very, very great net, uh, income. Um, but what I also found out is that I was kind of operating, I feel like from a, a mindset of scarcity when it really didn't exist and, uh, that held me back. But what would, then was happening was I was working five days a week. And I was stressed and, you know, I didn't have any freedom. So, um, you know, that finally caught up to me was the lack of freedom. And I used uh, more money to buy back freedom. And then that meant more time. And then actually the business flourished from there. So I think it was for me, it was a, a mindset of scarcity, even though it didn't really exist in some ways. And people think that freedom happens. And let's just define freedom for the conversation. So... 40 hours a week, maybe is what you're working. Let's call that freedom. Like Mm -hmm. maybe 30, I don't know, but whatever. Mm -hmm. More time with family, things like that. I don't think that people understand where your business needs to be for you to walk away for like a week at a time and still make money. In my opinion, freedom comes from when your business is, is a machine where you can walk away and things are automated, sales are flowing in. And that's not a quarter million dollar business. Mm -hmm. That's not like you're still learning that. And so I think that people expect because even that level of income is still so far and few between in this country, right? People are not average making, you know, quarter Mm -hmm. mil. And that to me is when it starts getting really fun. That's when you're like, I have money to be a player in this shit. Mm -hmm. And the reason I've been so comfortable with spending more money is one, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I mean, that sounds silly out loud, but I don't. I, I make educated guesses, but I don't know what it's like to run an eight-figure business, but I'm damn sure going to find out. And so by putting myself in rooms where people are spending, you know, six figures on this, I'm like, I see them doing it. I, I want to play. This sounds like a fun game. And so I think that just making sure you're surrounding yourself and putting yourself in rooms where people are constantly getting uncomfortable and... I know when I was around that quarter million dollar mark, five of my friends, at least I kind of had to cut them off. Like my friend group really changed when I hit that quarter million dollar business because I was all of a sudden the smartest person. I was all of a sudden the happiest person. And I think that entrepreneurship, like if you're really trying to make it understand that who you are day one is literally so different than who you're going to be in the next few years. Like every day is day zero. If you look at it the right way. Yeah. Cause you keep evolving. Um, I wanted to ask this cause I, I think you brought it up a couple of times in the last one we did mentors. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on them? And what, what what do you even look for in a mentor? Because it's changed a lot, like from where our generation grew up. Like, so for example, like a guy who was a mentor to me, Eric, he's going to come on our podcast, big CEO. He exited 50 mil plus in in a company. Yeah. Just brilliant man. And he was like one of the first men to just kind of sit me down and all that, but he like covered the meal 
any covered by coffee. And when I think in our space, we hear a lot of mentors, but there's a high ticket value mm -hmm. always attached totally. to it. How do you decide for where to go and how should someone regulate their comfort with what they spend in today's world for a mentor? Because that's where my mind goes like, well, if I want Jason to mentor me, what's a fair value for that? Like, how does Jason even define this? I, I, this is what is hard for me. You know, I'm not the mentor that charges the most in the space at all. Like at all. I and would how say. You don't do that though. Because you're very qualified. Like, I mean, every car, every conversation for me has been brilliant. I like to, I, I don't like to be more than 10% of my client's bottom line. I like to stay around that mark if I can. They, it may not start out like that, right? Like if you have no business and you're investing, right? right? But you know, if, if that's just where I'm at right now. Um, and so obviously as you make more, my price increases based on the level that I'm, I'm working with you at. But when you're finding a mentor, I mean, do not hire a mentor based on the setup of the program or coaching container. So I get beginners all the time saying, you know, well, I don't know that I want a course like, or a program. I need one-to-one. -one. No, you don't. You do not need one-to-one -one coaching to hire your first client. Like, I know you feel special, but you're not a special snowflake. Like you just need the foundation. You need me to kick your ass and you need accountability. Now, as you continue to grow, I think masterminds have become really popular. However, a lot of them suck out there. And so, I mean, I've had people tell me that they came from manifestation masterminds. They paid 5K a month for masterminds and they're making 10K months. I mean, it's a manifestation mastermind. Can I ask this? You manifest yeah. the client. You manifest money. It's a, it's a vibe. <laughs> it's a vibe. Um, I believe in manifestation with um, action, you know, but that's it. So I wish I would have been in a group. So I've only had mm -hmm. private mentors and I hope somebody hears this or it doesn't think I need to only do that because Taylor did that. It's because when I first got into the, to this space, even though 2019 wasn't that long ago, there weren't masterminds and programs yet. Like they were kind of nope. just coming out. And so I worked with a business coach who was very green in her business coaching and she only did one-to-one. -one. So that's why it was like that. But, you know, I think when you're finding a mentor. I look for somebody who complements areas that I'm not good at. I look for somebody who has the same life values as me, but I don't look for the same person as me. I don't want to hire a friend, right? Like I want to have a good relationship, but I don't need to hire the same person as me. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, I, I'm, I'm not the person who like needs to DM, Hey, can I talk to your clients? Like I'm, I'm a driver when it comes to buying, like I, I look for your credentials. I look where you've been featured. Um, I made the mistake early on with looking at blue check marks and follower counts. Um, my most recent mentor that I will probably never, ever leave had less than a thousand followers. And I was referred to this person. There was no sales page there. It, like it just felt different. And I felt like this person was very, very well versed in all things entrepreneurship. And so I think when you're first starting out, find somebody who is an expert in your space as you scale, make sure your mentor is also continuously up leveling their knowledge. I know that's one of the things that my clients always yeah, told me. Man, that's huge because I'm going to say something like I've been in groups for me and you have, and it eventually hits a point where I, I don't know if it's because what I read, I don't know if it's because the conversations we have on the podcast, but I eventually hit a point where I'm like, I now know more than you. Yes. And you have stopped even going up further right. and trying and it becomes very apparent and you're just like, I don't know how I feel about taking bids last you because you feel, figured out the niche for this one thing, but you're trying to say you could do something else when you can. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so I think, I don't know, my clients are always super excited because I, you know, remember this year, for example, like my mentor raised, raised their rates 40%. And I was like, whatever, sign the dotted line. I mean, I don't even think about it. It's literally just, it is what it is at this point. I would kind of do whatever. And I think that's when you have a true partnership, but also that doesn't happen year one. I think people need to understand that when you work with a mentor, it gets better year over year over year. If you hire a mentor and you're there for 365 days, and that I do one year contracts, I have no problem saying that at all. Because in my opinion, if you're, if you're a six figure business owner, by the time we implement a new project, like I move faster than most people, right? Like I meet my fucking deadlines. Speaking of what's important, set some fucking deadlines. If you don't know how to set and meet deadlines, your business will not scale. Like you have to be so accountable at doing that. I swear to God, the amount of people when they get in the entrepreneurship 
And that like, and, and I think Logan, even me, I've lectured you on this before, the whole not keeping a schedule to like their mm. desk, not mm-hmm. keeping a, yeah. And I'm like, bro, you don't, or girl, you don't keep a schedule, it could be in there at 7 a.m. And you know, it's like, and that was Steve, something Steve had told me, it's a famous author's quote, I can't, don't know the author, but it was like, inspiration hits every day and lucky for me it's at 9 a.m. You know what I mean? It was one of those where yep. no matter what, you got to put your ass in the seat. And I think a lot of people mistake that because usually in entrepreneurship, I always hear, oh, it must be nice. I'm like, what? That I can never be without my cell phone yeah. for the rest of my fucking right. life as long as I want to do this business? Right. Well, that's just the outside yeah. Okay, it's got to be great. I can't be on Christmas vacation at Key West with my family without hearing someone's shit in the middle, in the garbage can upstairs rather than use the toilet at the gym. Yeah. Like, why? The amount of coaches, though, that I work with where... I really focus on like in business and on business days. So making sure that they are not doing all of the tasks, all of the days. So in business days would be client work, client check-ins, sales calls on business is like projects, team stuff, expansion Mm -hmm. and theme days almost. Correct. Correct. Like if otherwise you're, you're going to be task switching and your efficiency is going to go down. But like you said, I wake up at 5am every day. I don't do it. I don't have a morning routine per se, but literally 5 a.m. I wake up, I go downstairs to my treadmill in my garage. I do DMs for 45 minutes, make food, coffee shop by 6.30 a.m., work, train afterwards. But like if I'm even, if I'm at the coffee shop even at seven, I'm like, oh fuck, I'm late today. And I feel bad. Like I literally feel bad. If I don't get up and do my walk, I literally feel like something is wrong. And like your habits Mm -hmm. have to be so fucking dialed in that you feel wrong. Yeah, it's a ritual to me. Yes, and I yep. almost feel like don't feel like clean for the day if I don't. Yes, do it. lack of a better way of saying it. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. But yeah. Yeah. Okay, so when you're looking for a mentor, what do you think is a reasonable price? Are they I, looking at your number? When you said ten percent, <laughs> and, and you said the numbers like that, I'm like, okay, so someone. Because we've seen them all over. Like, you know, that was one thing our old podcast, Mm -hmm. Epsilon's Cartel, did. We saw people who were 50 grand for a year, and we saw someone who was like five grand for a year. How do you decipher who's better, things like that? Should you should the person be asking to see your numbers? I don't think so. And what you're doing and things like that. 